cloaks on it and they sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise thee, O Christ. We confess our faith together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, my Lord, my Lord, very God, very God, begotten and not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated.
grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Consider this congregation. There were divisions in that congregation over which pastor was the best preacher. They argued about who was most blessed by the pastor who baptized them, Pastor A, Pastor B, or Pastor C. Imagine a church where the people permitted and did not have any problem with sexual immorality. Or how about a congregation that was constantly going to the secular courts and bringing lawsuits against each other? Or how about a congregation that did not understand what marriage was all about? Or how about a congregation that fought over the Lord's Supper? Or doubted the resurrection? Or a host of other things? That is the congregation that St. Paul wrote to in the city of Corinth. It was far from a perfect congregation, which is not surprising because God does not call perfect people to be his own, but rather imperfect people, people who are caught and captured in sin. And that's what makes the words of the text uh, so incredibly important and interesting for us. There Paul wrote, I always give thanks to my God for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. In every way you were enriched, that is, you were made extremely wealthy in Christ, in all speech and in all knowledge. Wealthy not in material things, but rather very wealthy in spiritual matters. As a result of this, you are not lacking any, any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Put that together with my introduction and you have a people who are far from guiltless. Their sin is evident. It's, it's rampant. It can't be ignored. It can't be denied. First Corinthians is understood to be one of Paul's angry epistles. He wasn't happy with them. He wasn't happy with the way the congregation was developing as, as time went on. And they seemed to fall back into their pagan ways of living. They had a better way, a better life, that they should live a life in the Spirit, a life that is directed by God and His Word, a promise given to us, given to them, for their salvation and for the betterment of not just their own life, but the lives of others. I always give thanks to my God for you. In spite of their sin, Paul gives thanksgiving for the Corinthians. As a pastor, if I were serving a congregation like when Paul is addressing here in, in this letter, I don't know that I would be, maybe Bill would, but I wouldn't be able to say that I give thanks to my God for you. It's just not part of me, but it's part of Paul. He can give thanks to God for a congregation that is so far from God, so far from what God has in mind for his people to be. I give thanks to my God because of the grace that God has given you in Christ Jesus. And right there is the crux the cross of the matter, the grace of God given to you in Christ Jesus. <laughs> that word grace shines through. As I said before, God does not call us to be his own because we are so perfect, but rather because we're imperfect. 
When we look at our relationship with God, we come to him as beggars, imploring him to have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The, the three-pronged Kyrie speaks to our hearts. We need God's mercy. We need God's grace. Without it, we're nothing. Nothing in terms of our relationship with God. They, he continued by, by saying that you have been enriched in all speech and all knowledge. The word enriched, like I said, and read it in, in reading the text, to be enriched is to be made very wealthy, uh, to, to have a great deal of wealth, a lot of stuff. But the stuff that St. Paul is speaking of are the importance of speech and knowledge. They knew how to talk. They knew what to say. They were very smart, very knowledgeable about the things of God. They just couldn't put their knowledge and their faith together. But in spite of that, you are not lacking in any gift, any spiritual gift. The gifts that Paul outlines in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. Gifts of the Spirit given for the manifestation, the revealing of Christ to his people and Christ to the world. You have the gifts, but he might add, but you don't yet know how to use them. Because again, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 weren't written to commend the Corinthians for their exercise of the gifts of the Spirit, preaching, teaching, evangelizing, and all the rest, but rather because they were misusing them, using the gifts for their own benefit, for their own welfare, their own well-being, not as means by which they would serve the neighbor or even serve God. But rather, they became places where they would boast of their moral and spiritual perfection. I'm better than you are because I speak in tongues. Well, I'm better because I prophesy, speak God's word. Paul said enough of that stuff. Even though I speak in tongues, Paul said, I wish I didn't, so that I would be able to speak words that are humanly intelligible, words that people can understand. And finally, he goes on to stay, saying, we wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there we come to the Advent word, the revealing of Jesus Christ. In our popular thinking, there's three ways that Jesus reveals himself to us. The first way is what we are preparing for. That is the coming of Jesus as the infant in Bethlehem, the, the baby lying in a manger. The second coming is Jesus coming to us in word and sacrament, in the promise of absolution, in baptism, in the supper of our Lord. He comes to us through the reading of scripture, through the discussion of what a particular Bible passage means for us as God's people today. He reveals himself to us in such a way that we would know who Jesus Christ is and what Jesus has done for us and for our salvation. And finally, he brings the climax, and that is, we wait for the revealing of Jesus our Lord, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the third way in which our Lord Jesus comes to us, the third advent. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. And Paul says to this miserable bunch of sinners, Jesus 
will preserve you guiltless in the day in which our Lord returns. He doesn't give license to the, the Corinthians to live their life the way they would want to as they saw fit. If that were the case, you wouldn't be writing this epistle to them. You just say, well, go on, do your thing. It's none of my business. Who am I to judge? But he judged them very severely because they were in sin and they needed to be brought to repentance. But in spite of their sinfulness, they would be held guiltless in the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord's return. That's a powerful message for us in our own lives because none of us can claim any kind of moral or spiritual um, perfection. None of us can go to God and say, look what I've done. You should love me as a result of it. None of us are able to approach the Lord's altar with pride and arrogance that says, Lord, you come to me, not I come to you. But in spite of our pride and arrogance, God does indeed come to us. He come to, comes to us as a baby in Bethlehem. He comes to us as the Lord who died and rose again for the forgiveness of our sins. He comes to us with the promise that by His grace we have freedom from the power of sin, death, and the devil. All because Jesus was willing to die for you and for me and give us the fullness of what it means to be the sons and daughters of God. Part one, we're not perfect. Part two, God is. Part three, because of his perfection, God makes us perfect in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And may the peace of God which passes understanding keep your hearts and minds in that faith to life everlasting. Amen. <laughs>
Almighty God be with the governing authorities, enable them to preserve peace and order in our nation. Here are prayers for Donald, our president, for Joe, our president-elect, for Gretchen, our governor, our military and police and other civil servants, as well as all newly elected officials. Increase the spirit of unity and cooperation among the people of our land and the nations of the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Compassionate Lord, behold in mercy all who are in danger, trouble, sickness, and need. Hear our prayers for the sick, especially for those who are from among us and in need of our prayers. Give help to our world and bring the pandemic to an end. Comfort all who mourn and sustain them with the hope of the resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Eternal Lord, as your son once entered humbly into Jerusalem to Christ of Hosanna, so send him to us according to his promise in the Holy Sacrament, that we may eat his body and drink his blood in repentance and faith for the forgiveness of sins and in the unity of a true confession. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. In your hands, Father, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Blessed be the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is mean and right so to do. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord whose way John the Baptist prepared, proclaiming him, the Christ, the Messiah, the very Lamb of God, and calling sinners to repentance that they might escape from the wrath to be revealed when he comes again in glory. <coughs> Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Holy, holy, Thank you. 
Pardon me, please. The spiritual drawing was true.
body and blood preserve us in the true faith, the life everlasting. Hear us for the sake of your name, Jesus our Savior. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Bless we the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.